I enjoyed the song the choir sang. It was absolutely perfect for the sermon that I was going to preach today that I'm not going to preach. <laughs> I told Mark during the week, I said uh, what I was going to be preaching on, and he said, uh, and I, I, I heard the choir uh, practicing um, Wednesday night, and we were talking about how good it was going to be. And yesterday morning, I got up, and uh, uh, I had... Uh, to see some people down here in Gainesville, and I was going to do some work at the church. And um, I drove by a church that's probably a quarter of a mile from the house. A friend of mine, Tom Fish, pastors a Ebenezer Methodist Church. And I looked up there on their on their thing, and it said Resurrection Sunday. Oh, excuse me, it said Ascension Sunday. And I thought, oh my goodness, that is this Sunday, isn't it? It's Ascension Sunday. And I was just one of those moments where I went, okay, good, fine, that's great, all right. Then I drive about another half mile, and I thought, you know, and I started thinking. And then I have a pad that, now, y'all aren't supposed to do this when y'all drive. But if you got a sermon that's coming to you in a hurry, you want to be able to write it down. So I whooped out my pen, drove with my knees. I was driving by faith and not by sight. So um, I started to jot down some things real quick, and I was writing them for the next five, eight minutes driving down the road. Praise God, it was a four lane, so it was pretty straight. I jotted down some things, and I thought, because I was, I was still just saying, uh, I just wanted to write those things down that the Lord was saying to me. I wasn't thinking about changing my sermons by no means. And I got down here and um, went by the first meeting, and went by the church office, and I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, should I, what should I preach, Lord? Now, you, you don't you done confuse me now. What should I do? And I leaned back in my chair, and I looked up. Y'all ever do that? And I looked up, and I saw a spider hanging down by one thread. And it was just hanging there. And I'm looking at it. And, I, and it was a small, little bitty spider just hanging by one thread. And, and they... In the office over there, it's got these fluorescent lights. Y'all know what I'm talking about? we got to change those things. That's killing my eyes. But I, I'm looking over there, and I'm just looking at that, and I'm thinking, he's just hanging there. And I got thinking, oh, it was like a rush came over me. Like when, the, when, when they stood that day, and Jesus said goodbye, and gravity was suspended, and the Lord was gathered back to heaven. What a day. That must have been. And what that meant to them. And that was this past week. This is the Sunday following the ascension. And I just stared at that little spider. He wasn't going anywhere. Matter of fact, that afternoon I went to another meeting and I came back by the church and Jody, my daughter, came by the office to make her a cup of coffee. I said, Jody, do you see that? She said, yeah, you want me to get it? I said, no, 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 no. Leave him alone. He's, he, he's preaching to me up there. <laughs> so if it's okay with you, uh, my last sermon in my series on exercising your faith will be next Sunday. We're going to talk about exercising your faith through prayer. But if it's all right with you, let's just pause today and think about our Lord, the resurrected Lord, the ascended Lord, and the Lord who is exalted for now and forever. Amen? Amen? Psalms 110 came to my mind. You don't have to go there because I'm going to hit a bunch of verses all at once. There's so many. Kale will have them up on the screen. But Psalms 110 verse 1 says, The Lord said to my Lord, by the way, Jesus quoted this, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. That's the Father saying to Jesus, just be here at my right hand. Sit at my right hand. There's still going to be some things happening on earth, and I will make all of your enemies your footstool. You'll just prop your feet up for right now at the right hand of the Father. And by the way, that's exactly where Christ is today. Scripture Bible tells us that He is making intercession for us. He watches over us. 
He provides for us. He takes care of us. He loves us. He prays for you. He prays blessings over you. We talked about in Sunday school this morning, one of them, we were talking about the Lord's Prayer, and, and they said that they be, first thing that they do when they wake up in the morning is begin the prayer. I said, don't say it amen to the end of your day. Let your prayer go along all day long, and at the end of your day, you can say unto, my, unto your hands, Lord, I, I give myself unto you as I rest this night. My day is now yours, amen. And then I told her, I said, look, and the Lord will pray for you as you sleep. He will make intercession for you. He is exactly where he needs to be, doing exactly what he needs to do. Romans 8, verse 31 says, What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, drop down three verses. Verse 34 says this, It is Christ who died, and furthermore, is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Ephesians 1, verse 17 says this, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, in the saints, His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places far above all principalities far above all powers far above all might far above all dominions in every name that is named, no name can compare with him. Not only in this age, but in that which is to come. I have one more scripture to read to you, but before I do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Father, when I share with people about you, I'm always going to tell them that you're the God of all eternity. You're the God of creation. You're the God who saw us before we were formed, before the world was formed. And you allowed us to be born. You gave us life. And that we sin. And our sin separates us from you because you're a holy God. Lord, I tell them that you left the throne in glory, took off your robes, and came to be born of a virgin. You walked in human flesh. You lived a sinless life. You cared for everyone that you met. You told us the good news. You performed the good news. You lived out the good news. You allowed them to take you and place you on a cross, beaten and broken, whipped and scorned, mocked and ridiculed. You let them drive nails through your hands and your feet. You hung on the cross naked embarrassed in hu human terms humiliated you gave what only you could give your life the eternal faced human death 
but the Spirit gave you life. And that which was dead was quickened and alive again, resurrected on Resurrection Sunday, so that we could not just know the story, but Lord, testimony could be that you are alive and well and there for us. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the empty tomb. And thank you for the resurrected Savior making intercession for us. But Lord, I don't often tell them that you appeared before people for 40 days. And after that 40 days, you gathered your disciples, those followers, on a hill and raised your hands and was received back to glory. Visible to the eye, seen by the angels, but seen by those who followed you as well. In the proper place. Lord, I don't often tell people about when you went home. I don't often tell them about the angels that sang your presence home and are singing now today, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. I don't often tell them of how you're cheering us on. Highly exalted, name above all names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and earth and those under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But Lord, those truths are just as important as the first truths. It is the completion of the good news. It is the home that you've gone to prepare for us. That you are there in oversight and blessing until the day that you will either call us home by name through that avenue of death or through the trumpet's blow of rapture where we will be gathered home to you. But Lord, one thing that we know is you gave us life. You gave us an eternal soul. And Lord, that you made the gospel real to everyone who would believe. And Lord, our eternity is in your hands. The destiny of our forever is with you. You hold us and you keep us and you're going to bless us for time and forevermore. And Lord, we live in this parentheses of time. We walk this path of this sinful earth. We face temptations. We see Satan's work happening. Lord, our hearts are broken for people who so stubbornly and so narcissistically live for themselves and blame others for the things of life and for their mistakes. And they never pause and humble themselves before you. But I pray that they do. I pray for us, your people, Lord, that we would be the light that we were given the privilege to be. Yes, we were called to, but Lord, that's the life worth living is a life under your power and in your strength and for your glory. No life can be like that. No life has a greater value to it than that. And Lord, I know then this earth will grow strangely dim. But I pray, Lord, that you'll get us a, give us a glimpse of it now as we see you exalted, high above all. Lord, as John the Baptist said, may you increase. Lord, as we are here, may we decrease. Let them see Jesus in us. Let us see Jesus in faith. Oh God, I can do nothing, but you can do all things. And there's a promise that you, you spoke over all of us that when we are weak, that you are, we become strong in Christ and that 
we can do all things when we join you and we are yielded to you and humble before you and we can do all things through the power, the mighty strength of the resurrection in us. So Lord, for what we've, you've called us to maybe, awaken to it today. For your glory and for our benefit and for this world that we live in, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, a person who did not know me, who um, I do not know except by his reputation, went to be with the Lord this past Friday. Uh, just a little bit older than I am. Pastored a church in Manhattan when at that time, 1989, that he went there, there was only 5,000 Christians in church in Manhattan that had a, a million people. He was laughed at by everyone that, that, that New York was too liberal, they were too far gone, that, that people wouldn't listen to a, an orthodox gospel that he was willing to preach, a conservative Christ, Christ alone. The people were into the things of this world, but he went there and was used of God in an amazing way. And now thousands and tens of thousands of Christians are meeting in the and actually the very, the very place of Manhattan. And I give God glory for that, amen? Three years ago, Tim Keller, who had written so many books, uh, trained up so many young preachers, um, was told by the doctor that he had pancreatic cancer. And the doctor told him, this will kill you. We have no cure for it. Uh, you will die of this. Now, usually when you hear the doctor say the C word, just hearing that word just changes your view of everything. But there's another C word, it's called Christ. And we live not under the banner of a sickness, but we live under the banner of the Lord. Now, when I heard, actually I saw a text from Michael, Tim Keller's son, and it was said that, that he was dismissed from the hospital and he was going home and he would be under hospital care, but it would not be long. And he, Michael said that his father was praying, Lord, let me go, let me go, let me go. I want to see Jesus. I want to see Jesus. This, a few months ago, I, I saw a podcast that Tim was being interviewed on and, and he was sharing and he, said, he made this remark. He said, I would not change a thing. He said, my wife and I feel so very blessed because in the last three years, we have found an intimacy with God that we never had before. And this closeness in prayer that God has given us has blessed us so very much. If it had not been for the cancer, he said there's something about it when the doctor says, you're going to die. And you know that your time is short. And you know that you're going to move past this earth and move into the presence of the Almighty. That the things of earth grow strangely dim. The things that we value, that we spend our time and our energy and our money on, those things those things don't matter so much. And the things that we put off like forgiveness and restoration and love and relationships and devotion and true investment, we always procrastinate those things. But this is not our home. We're just passing through. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lived in tents, temporary. But we're going to a city whose builder and maker is, come on church, give him glory. God, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. We're going home. We're going home to a place 
that's beyond what I has seen or un- could even comprehend, exceedingly abundantly above. When the great pastor R.G. Lee of Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee, when he was at the end of his days, Adrian Rogers, who went to be the pastor there at Bellevue, he was, his, he was Dr. Lee's pastor for a little time. And he was visiting him. <clears throat> and Dr. Lee told Dr. Rogers and said, I've seen heaven. Dr. Rogers said, tell me about it. He said, I can't. He said, you couldn't understand it. Dr. Rogers said, I'd love to have your mind. I'd love to have your mind, Dr. Lee. And he said, that'd be like taking a grand piano and put it in a closet. You don't have. You can't understand. But when God gave Dr. Lee that glimpse of glory, Dr. Rogers said those blue eyes just twinkled. And nothing else he wanted to talk about anymore except heaven. Are y'all ready for heaven? Yes, Jesus left heaven to come to earth. He lived a sinless life. He went to the cross, a brutal, cruel cross. He died a death that no man should ever have to die. He took my sin and your sin. He bore them all on Himself. The Father turned His back upon Him. Jesus shouted, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because my sin was placed upon Him. But He said, Unto thy hands I commend my spirit. He knew where He was going. He knew God could take care of him. He gave up the spirit and went home. The grave got the body, but the Lord got the spirit. And when it was time for me and for you, he gave life back again. So not only that he could be the conqueror of death, we could participate in that with him. And 40 days later, after meeting with his disciples, He gathered with them one last time to let them know, I'm going home. Jesus had a body. Jesus had a resurrected body. It's the only body that we're going to see in heaven that had scars in it. Y'all remember him talking to Thomas? Thomas said, I won't believe until I see. Well, Thomas, here it is. See the nail prints in the hands? Look at my side. Do you believe? The scars. Jesus was seeing the disciples out in the boat and He was on the shore. He gave them a fishing lesson again. Amen? When they realized that's who it was, they went to the shore and Jesus was cooking breakfast. And He ate with them. He had a physical body. He ate with them. And he was always about doing once again. Every time Jesus appeared in the resurrected body, it was to bless, it was to lead those on the road to Emmaus. At first they didn't understand who was before them, but but when they heard him pray and, and, and break the bread, it's like the scales fell from their eyes and they knew that it was it was Jesus. And he said, did not our hearts burn within us? He was always doing, which is basically what we're supposed to be doing. But now he's in heaven. And it's a view of what our lives will be. We'll have fellowship together there. The Bible says that we will know as we are known. That means nobody's got to introduce me to Joshua or Achan. No one's going to have to tell me, hey, Moses, 
Get this. Y'all ready for this? Nobody's going to have to tell Moses that's Brian. He may come up to me and say, well, I heard you preached about me a few times. I said, no, I was preaching about Jesus. I wasn't preaching about you. We will know as we are known. There's not going to be any big shots or little shots in heaven. There's not going to be upper class or lower class in heaven. There's not going to be rich or poor in heaven. There's not going to be educated, uneducated in heaven. We will be like him. We will be like him. And that gives us an ability to fellowship with him. There'll be new life, eternal life. I think one of the things that God allows us to walk through this life, how many of y'all know pain? That was an amen moment and y'all blew it. Anybody ever known heartache? Anybody ever known brokenness? Anybody ever known sorrow? Anybody knew something that just overwhelmed you so much, burdened you so much that you can't even describe how terrible it was? You know, all the things that you've experienced down here will just make the joy of all that place without any of those things better. No more goodbyes. No more heartache. I'll see mom. I'll meet my grandma. I'm looking forward to a hug. Some of y'all have had grandparents that I've never had. I want a hug. I want to have a conversation. I want to say, why didn't you beat your, dad, your boy born? My dad, why didn't you beat him more? No, I won't. No, I won't. No, I won't. I might think, no, I won't. There's going to be fellowship. There's going to be joy. No sadness. This resurrected body of Christ traveled at the speed of thought. The disciples were in a room. Jesus didn't come knocking at the door. He's there. And when he was gone, he's gone. We're not going to have to worry about any of those things when we get into eternity. We will be surrounded by the glory of God. You won't have to say, there will never be an inch in heaven that you do not feel 100% the spirit and glory of God. There will not be a second of an iota of all of eternity where you will not feel the complete splendor of the very best of God for you. No more mistakes. No more stubbing your toe. No more saying things incorrectly that hurt somebody's feelings. Those things are gone. We get the joy of the joy of the joy of Christ forever. Jesus ascended to leave us an example. If, if he had just been popping up in here and there and he was with this group here, and he, he was seen by 500 there, and, and, and they talked to him on the road to Emmaus. But then he was gone. Everybody would have said, I wonder what happened. Where has he been? He told him what he was going to do, and for their benefit, listen, and as an example of what would happen for us, he was taken away. And the angels watched as they watched. And the angel said, Hey, don't be, don't be sad. This one that you've seen go up, he's coming back Amen. for you, for you. Now, until then, you've got a job to do. He'll call you when, you're, when he's ready for you. You're not going to get there until. So be about his business. And they watched him. What would that be like to watch him go up in the clouds to receive him back to glory? Would you like to see him in the clouds? Listen, if today is the day, and I don't know that it's not, the trumpet will blow and Christ will come back into the clouds and call us home. Amen. The rapture of the church, the believers will be changed in the twinkling of an eye and then we'll get that same trip that he went. 
We'll get to see when, when he, was, he was there and he went back to glory uh, the first time. We'll, we'll have a kind of a, a same experience to, to see the presentation. The week before the cross, he came into Jerusalem riding on a coat of a donkey. Never been ridden before. And something began to percolate in the heart of those people there, those followers. And somehow Scripture began to burn in their hearts and they began to praise Him. And they began to honor Him. And they went, somebody got the idea, let's take the palm branches and cut them and lay them down so, or, or lay their coats down so, so that He would not even have to tread the touch of this earth. And they begin to shout his praises. Hosanna! Son of David! Christ! That's what they were saying. Messiah! Someone said, no, no, no. Tell your disciples to quit saying this. Oh, no. If they don't say it, the rocks will cry out. I heard a preacher say one time, no rocks going to steal my glory. I'll shout his praise too. But when he ascended that day, the angels saw him. They saw him when he left heaven, when he took off the robes of glory and came down to be born of a virgin. He looks different now. Scars. The burden of time has been lifted. He's coming home. Well done. Come home. Now, if I introduced Christ and He came walking in here, we'd all hit our face. Amen? Nobody would say, uh, it's the time in the service that we bow before the King. If you know Christ, you cannot be in His presence without bowing before Him. But there would be something inside of me that would want to get out. Bless you. Thank you. Glory. I wonder what those created beings who said no to Lucifer and said yes to Christ. Yes, sir, I will serve you. Yes, sir, I belong to you. Yes, sir, you are the only one that deserves to be on the throne. You are holy, God. You are holy, God. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Can you see the crescendo begin to blend, to grow as it just spreads throughout all of heaven? Christ is coming home. The attention is on one. As He makes His way to the throne of God, and when a job is completed, he sits down at the right hand of the Father. But that does not mean that the exaltation ends. The praise continues on. There is no break. The praise goes on. There is no weakening. It's, I believe this without a shadow of a doubt. In my heart, Every There are no seconds in heaven. There is no time in heaven. But every moment of all of eternity as I'm there, I'm going to love Him more. I don't think the first day that I get there and I see all of the glory, I'm going to fully comprehend. And I think the more that I see Him and the more that I know and the more that I meet the blessings of God around us, I think my heart will grow By the way, it should be doing the very same thing now. Down here on earth, when someone goes away, we forget about them. Just because Jesus has gone away from the earth does not mean we should forget about him. Doesn't mean we should go off and do our own business. Kind of like a glorious parade headed to the throne room. I was told a story of a young man who grew up. He had 
great privilege, but the privilege did not change him. He knew everyone in town. He was thought well of. He was always kind, always polite, always helpful. Everyone knew him. Everyone thought well of him, rich and poor. But World War II broke out, and he had to leave. And it was hard on his father when he had to leave, but he had to go to war. People said his father cried for him all the time, prayed for him all the time. At the end of the war, some came home. But some were delayed in coming home because they had been wounded in war. When the first came home, everybody was there to welcome them. But for this person, it was a little later, and they heard that he was coming home, and a few others were there coming home with him. Back in the day, what they would do is go to the train station, they would go through the small town. And they were there with signs to welcome the the hero who had been awarded special medals for his valor and how he had fought and how he had been wounded for the sake of others, protecting others. So they welcomed him there. They had a, he didn't have any car for himself, so they had a little bit of a makeshift parade. You know what I'm talking about? And they put him there in the back of a pickup truck. And they took him to where his dad was. What everybody didn't really realize was how bad the wounds were. The disfigurement of his face because of being burned. His arms, his legs. When they got to his home, they helped him down. And his dad was sitting on the front porch. Y'all know what I mean about the front porch? He had been hearing the noise of the parade. And his heart had been racing because of the love and the longing that he wanted to see his son. And when his father saw his son He saw the price that his son had to pay in battle. And his father stepped off the porch and went down the sidewalk and the son and the father met and just hugged as everyone around them just clapped. What it must have been that day when Jesus made it home. And the sounds of the joy are flowing all through heaven, but they're coming to that place where the Father would meet the Son. The only difference is the Father's eye was never off of His Son. Always with Him when they beat him, when they pulled out his beard, when they spat in his face. But the father also was there when they heard the son say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. But when they come together, the Trinity once again united together there in glory. And as the damaged Christ takes his seat, At the right hand, the power hand of the Father, the Father could say, it is finished, well done. But that's no different, though you don't realize it, though I can't comprehend it, though we feel unworthy of it, 
not deserving of it. Because of Christ, that's the welcoming we're going to get to. Because of Jesus, and the blood of Jesus that cleanses me of all my sins, that separates me, my sins as far as the east is from the west, when God looks at me, He doesn't see the old, dirty, rotten sinner. He sees me through the blood of Jesus Christ. He sees the perfect child of God. And I can't wait to feel the embrace and hear my Father say, Welcome home. Welcome home. By the way, He's coming back. Satan will be defeated. He'll be thrown into the lake of fire forevermore. And if you're a Christian, the Bible tells us we're coming back with him. And we will see Jesus put his feet on this earth. And he'll sit on the throne of the owner and the ruler of God's saved body of Christ on this earth for a thousand years. And then that last chapter of Revelation 21 and 22 going to come together and we'll see the tree of life and the river flowing from the throne and we'll get to be in glory forever and ever and ever. It will be worth it all. One day, we'll know it's all about Him. But Christians, if you're deceived, let me try to help you. It's already all about Him. We just need to give Him glory. One of the terms that I like for people who we've always called Christians I think that's gotten watered down. The Christians, I think, has gotten watered down. You ask people today, are you a Christian? They just say, yes, they might be, they might not be. But I like this term, believers. I like this term, follower of Christ. I'm, I'm, I'm about following Him. Until then, my heart will Go on singing until then. We'll carry on until the day. Oh, folks. Until the day when He calls us home. What are we doing, folks? What are we doing? Our life is to be about Him. I think that's what the Lord wanted me to realize yesterday. Is my life all about Him? It will be forever in heaven. I just need to choose to do it for Him today down here on earth.